Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the lecture. Today we are very honored to have Taro for this communicating environmental design sustainability lecture. Uh, I, I honestly think this lecture comes in a right time. I know many students are working for the concept design stage for project 1.3. And you know, from the observation from my own studio, um, I I think not many students could clearly communicate the set characters and their influence for their design ideas. Um, but I I believe uh, environmental design sustainability strategy should be planned at the early stage, and it has a long impact for the design development, the project development. And uh, you know it's a vital part for us to marking your development for this project. Um, uh, from the last last lecture, that's the DJ Map lecture from Alice, and that provides you a clear idea on how to download, you know, a very detailed, two scaled uh, digital map. And this lecture will have to help you to explain establish an idea on, you know, user drawing or diagrams to communicate your own strategy in environmental and sustainability uh, aspects. So, yeah, that, that's a brief introduction for uh, why we plan this lecture at this time. And um, so uh, I want to ask any student if you have a general question about this module, you can ask me now. Uh, for Tara's lecture, uh, please leave until the end of the lecture and raise your question during the Q&A. Um, if you don't have any question, I will just um, hand over to Tara. Okay, thanks Jennifer. Hi there everybody. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my slides. So you've got something to be looking at. There you go. Can someone just give me a, a quick yes or something in the, the chat to let me know that you can all see that and you can hear me fine and everything. Great stuff. Thank you very much. OK, so um, some of you um, already know me from Design Studio. So I teach in first year Design Studio. And because of the way timetabling has fallen, you'll actually be seeing me again tomorrow in your technology lecture, um, where I'm going to be talking to you about passive strategies. So apologies, you've got a bit of a, an intense week when it comes to, to delivery and contact time from me this week. Um, so just a little bit of sort of background to me, if you like. So I, uh, so I'm originally an architect by training. Um, but my PhD was specialising in sustainable building refurbishment. Um, so that's resulted in me sort of um, teaching design studio and environment and sustainability across both undergraduate programmes, both architecture and interior architecture. Um, so chances are you'll all see me, you know, like I said, some of you have me for design studio at the moment, but chances are you'll all come across me at some point, either in design studio uh, or for environmental and sustainable design lecture modules. Um, so today, as, as Jennifer sort of briefly um, explained, we're not looking at any particular type of drawing. So my understanding is that you might have had um, previous lectures which are focused perhaps particularly on site plans or particularly on sections, so kind of oriented around particular types of drawings. So today's lecture is, isn't really designed that way. It's designed more to look at how you can communicate a particular theme within your designs that theme being environmental and sustainable design and, and how that kind of uh, how those strategies operate within your work. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction, which just basically sets out the, the basic kind of premise, if you like, for why communicating environmental design and sustainability is important. What do we mean by those terms in the first place and what is it that makes them particularly hard to communicate? Um, and then I'd just like to run through some examples with you, really, um, of different types of drawings that do communicate an environmental or a sustainable design strategy. Um, so looking at contextual and site drawings and then kind of zooming in to look at drawings that convey a kind of building level strategy. 
and then zooming in again really to look at those kind of detail drawings that kind of um, convey how those sustainability strategies hold out to much more kind of detailed construction sort of level and then finally looking at very often sustainability strategies we're talking about something which unfolds over time and how do you capture that in a set of drawings um, and then we're going to have a quick discussion exercise um, basically we'll get a little bit of feedback from you guys about what you think works um, in so I'll give you an example of some sustainable some drawings which convey an environmental or sustainable design strategy um, for you guys to have a little bit of a think about and evaluate and think what you think works about them, what doesn't work about them so well. And then we'll kind of have a quick wrap up sort of feedback session uh, towards the end. So quite a lot to get through in an hour, but hopefully um, we'll manage to get through it without too much of a rush. OK, so just uh, I'm sure you've all seen this diagram many, many times by now, but it was really just to remind you that environment uh, and technology is is one of those um, threads, if you like, that runs throughout the entire undergraduate program. Um, so it's it's something it's 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 a topic that will follow you from year to year and as the program progresses um, you will more and more often be assessed through your ability to implement what you learn in this module in the design studio project and how well you communicate how you have done that will also be part of how you're assessed so that's one of the reasons why this is important so within the context of this sort of within the context of this module, which is all about introducing you to different forms of visual communication, today we're going to be focusing on three main learning objectives. So this is what I'm hoping you're going to get out of this session. So to gain an awareness of the various means of communicating environmental design and sustainability using visual methods, to begin to analyze two and dimensional graphics to identify which environmental and sustainable design strategies are being represented and then finally to start to critically appraise some of those examples of graphic communication in order to inform your own practice so what is it that you think that works that you'd like to adopt and carry forward in the way that you communicate your own sustainable and design strategies what do you think doesn't work and what might be appropriate at different stages of the design process Um, so I know you've started your, your technology module uh, with Zaid and Tarek, but just in case there is any uncertainty, when I'm talking about environment and sustainability, um, environmental design is basically broken down by the RIBA currently at the moment as you having an awareness essentially of four main topics, so heating and cooling, humidity and ventilation, lighting and acoustics, and obviously, increasingly within the context of the climate crisis and architects declare a much bigger proportion of this module is also given over to things like water management, biodiversity, renewable energy, all those things which support sustainable design. And I'm sure sustainability is a topic um, that you're all very familiar with. You are our first school strike cohort. Um, so I would certainly hope you sort of have an awareness of it. Um, and again, there are many and varied sort of definitions of sustainability, but this is the one which is most often quoted, I would say. This is referred to as the Brundtland definition, um, just because it was established in a 1987 commission chaired by uh, a man named Brundtland. Not that imaginative, but there you go. Um, so this defines sustainability really as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So hopefully now you're all clear about what it is that I mean when I talk about graphic communication that um, demonstrates or illustrates environmental and sustainable design. So hopefully at least we're sort of on the same page in terms of what it is we're talking about. So let's dive in and look at some examples. Oh, sorry, I've jumped ahead. Um, so one of the reasons why I one of the reasons why environmental and sustainable design, sorry, can be so difficult to draw. Um, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I think particularly because you are showing uh, processes and phenomena which can't be seen. 
So you can't see heat, you can't see noise, you can't see air movement. So how do you convey that in a diagram? Perhaps even more, more difficult, I think, with sustainable design is that you might even be communicating the absence of something which couldn't be seen in the first first place. So things like you're communicating that carbon emissions are not being produced, air pollutants are not being expelled into the atmosphere. So how do you communicate something is missing that couldn't be seen to begin with? That can be a particularly tricky one. Um, you're communicating often processes that unfold over time. So they might be unfolding daily, seasonally, um, or perhaps over a number of years. And this is something that we'll look at in the final set of examples of drawings. And you're also looking at processes that begin and end beyond the limits of your building or your site. So thinking about things like where your materials come from and where does your waste go, often extend beyond the building itself that you're, you're drawing. So now, now we'll look at some examples. Um, so beginning with this one, beginning with this idea of contextual and site drawings, I think this is perhaps one of those good examples of a drawing which does convey, um, you know, what's happening beyond the site itself or beyond the building itself. It's not that creatively drawn, but what it does do is it communicates thinking beyond the, the site itself to the wider region in the form of what we call a resource mapping exercise. So uh, what BBM Sustainable Design kind of did at the beginning of this project is they undertook this process of resource mapping, which was looking at what construction materials or skills could be sourced close to the site, either from kind of virgin natural resources. Um, so for example, they looked to source um, bricks um, from a, a brick manufacturer that was within, I think, sort of 10 to 15 miles of the site. And again, when sourcing new materials, looked at where they could coppice sweet chestnut timber, which was also within 10 miles of the site. Um, and again, this has got to do with the kind of the amount of emissions that go into transporting materials um, apart from anything else. They also looked at what we call urban mining. So where waste resources, perhaps from the existing building on the site um, or from sites nearby, where are there waste resources that can be reused? So maybe not natural materials, maybe sort of steel beams, um, you know, uh, copper lead flashings, copper piping, things like that, which which are not natural materials, which require a certain amount of processing, but which might be readily reclaimed from other demolition sites. And then uh, moving on, so this is another example of one of these kind of strategic level diagrams or drawings, um, which identifies the issues that are raised or addressed through the scheme and gives us an overview of the strategies employed, such as things like waste minimization, um, renewable energy, biodiversity, water management. So you can see on the, the right hand side there, sustainable drainage systems. Um, and other kind of um, policies for kind of reducing, reusing and recycling water and also sustainable transport. So looking at sort of car clubs and park and ride schemes and things like this. So what this drawing really does again is it provides context for each of the individual buildings rather than describing in detail where or how they're integrated into the building design. So again, it's kind of reiterating that this is much more of a strategic level drawing um, that communicates the overall con context and landscape for the site. So this is by the same architects, Field and Clegg Bradley. If you're not already aware of them, I suggest you check them out. They have a, a really long history um, of doing really quite sustainable projects um, long before sort of other architects um, started engaging with the topic. And they're also one of the founding practices of Architects Declare. And I guess what this, so this is the Accordia housing project in Cambridge. This won the Sterling Prize in 2008, I want to say, but it could be, could be a year or two out. Um, so this describes a much in much more detail the relationship between buildings on, of the kind of the housing project and the immediate landscape. 
And they really talk about this, and you can see this in the handwritten notes on the sketches. They really talk about urban rugs on a carpet of landscape. And what this creates is it creates these kind of green barriers around the edges of the site that absorb pollutants from adjacent traffic and improve air quality. It also crucially creates these kind of green corridors within the site internally, which is really important for biodiversity, for animals, insects, reptiles, etc., to be able to migrate safely across the site, perhaps from a ending site to a feeding ground, um, you know, making them much more resilient by isolating wildlife in these pockets, we undermine its ability to adapt and to survive. So creating these green corridors um, is really important. And of course, all of these green spaces also provide um, us with contact with nature, which is really good for our well-being and the immediate and amenity benefits for occupants as well in terms of spaces to enjoy outside. And again, this was something which was really kind of um, the something which Field and Clegg Bradley or, or FCBs, as they tend to brand themselves these days, really tried to communicate in the in the sketches and the photography of their scheme as well. That this is yes, this has an ecological benefit, but it also has this amenity benefit for the people actually living uh, on the site as well. So it's it's kind of a bit of a no brainer. And then another Sterling Prize winner. Um, so this was this is Goldsmith Street by Mikhail Riches. Um, hopefully some of you will have seen this um, already. Um, but this was a passive house scheme, another housing scheme, social housing this time in Norwich. Um, and this was des designed to passive house standards, which basically means that so passive house relies on solar gain or sunshine for heating. Um, but you also then have to take measures if you're trying to maximize solar gain in the winter, you also have to take measures to protect yourself from overheating in the summer. And I think what this site section shows really well is how the profile of the roof, as well as the spacing of the blocks, maximizes the amount of sunshine that's allowed in, that's able to access into the houses in the winter. So the whole kind of site plan, when you look at it as a site section, you can see how the distribution of those blocks has been really carefully considered to inform the environmental design. Um, and then similarly, hopefully you can see, I don't know how clear it is, you might have to go back and inspect the drawing in a little bit more detail. But then they have these overhead shading devices above each of the windows um, so that actually in the summer, when the sun is at a much higher angle, uh, that window is then protected from excessive solar gains and protected from overheating. And then my final example of a more kind of contextual or site level drawing shows water management. So obviously this is the Eden project by Grimshaw Architects. Um, architecturally, uh, the PTFE bubbles are, are not one of my favorites, but the site does have a great kind of ecological agenda. Um, and basically this diagram sort of shows um, how water is collected and stored and then how it basically just uses gravity to allow it to run down the sides of the quarry, performing all sorts of functions, including feeding plants and humidifying the air. And then when it reaches the bottom, it can be pumped back up to the top and recirculated. I guess from a sustainable point of view, uh, what the, the kind of the question there is kind of what, what electricity is feeding that pump. And you would certainly hope that that would be uh, powered by a renewable source rather than something using fossil fuels. Otherwise, it kind of undermines the premise of the site a little bit. Um, but just a, a kind of so there's any number of things which you can be drawing and mapping the kind of the progress of and the root of at a site level. So we will move on to drawings that communicate more of a building level strategy. Um, so this is Perovo housing in Slovenia. Um, and this drawing, I think, shows at a building level how units were oriented to maximize solar gains and daylight. Again, something that we're going to look at in much more detail in technology tomorrow. Um, but I think what's interesting is also then looking at how you maintain privacy within that. So you've got one unit which has its kind of its solar gains, so it's massive glazed area oriented to the south 
which is obviously sort of more ideal. Um, and then another one to the west. Um, but the idea is that because these are offset on different sides of the building, you balance both the solar gains that are available with the kind of privacy of occupants, each having their own kind of outside space without having to stick a fence down the middle of there in a very kind of UK sort of style, I suppose, to maintain that privacy and thereby kind of blocking all the solar gain um, to the second house at the back there. So it's always a balancing act between these things, because even if you maximise solar gains, if people don't feel comfortable in that space because of other reasons, like feeling like the space is too public, it's not going to get used and a space that isn't being used is not that sustainable. Um, so moving on to the SALT building uh, in Vancouver, I think this section is probably representative of what a lot of people think of when they think of an environmental diagram or a section. So this kind of overlay uh, of a CAD drawing of a, a finished scheme showing a range of different systems and processes. So I think on there you've got your underfloor heating, um, you've got your uh, solar gain, you've got your ventilation got some mechanical ventilation in there as well. Um, and I guess in this case, you could argue that actually that way of presenting the information does function quite well with the functionalism and all the exposed technical technical components of the building itself. So you can kind of see photograph that all of those technical elements are really kind of um, celebrated in the architecture. So maybe it makes sense that you'd communicate them that way in a, di in a diagram as well. Um, I guess my uh, my criticism of that particular diagram um, would probably be that I don't think it really gives much of a sense of how these things are working together, how solar gain and ventilation are working together, how ventilation and underfloor heating are working together. Um, so it doesn't really give you much of a sense of, of how the how the building is functioning as a whole. Um, you basically just get an overlay of a series of systems. And I guess the main thing I'd like to underline is that whilst this is what most people think of when they think of an environmental diagram, and I do get a lot of these from students, these overlays with you know funny coloured arrows going every which way, this is not what an environmental diagram has to look like. So hopefully some of the following diagrams will, will kind of help to um, communicate that, if you like, that there are any number of ways. Um, Yes, Veronica, would you like to ask a question? OK, well, I'll carry on and we'll come back to it at the end if there is a question there. Um, so if we move on to uh, Anne House in Vietnam, um, so hopefully uh, what this diagram uh, is showing is that environmental and sustainable design is certainly not something that you should leave to thinking about until you have a finished scheme. Um, so this is an example of quite an early diagram um, showing how the environmental strategy really fits in with the concept for the building. So communicating things like uh, solar gain and daylighting, really understanding how these really strong kind of horizontal elements can be broken up to bring daylight into the building, to allow the spaces within the building to be ventilated very often through these kind of vertical openings um, and bringing planting into the building, uh, you know, but which is, is this planting is partly accommodated by these openings in the floor slab um, to kind of promote occupant well-being as well. And then in contrast, some sketches might include high levels of resolution about what the internal, you know, fit out space is going to look like. Um, but I think it's equally important that when you get to that level of kind of technical resolution, I think what works particularly well about this drawing is that level of uh, occupation, if you like, that gives us a sense of how these strategies actually improve the environment for the occupants rather than being purely technical drawings. So you can kind of see how the light shelf just above the window helps to bounce uh, daylight deeper into the room. Uh, also, how those kind of ceiling rafts help to improve acoustics within the space. Um, and also then how that's supplemented by some of the kind of ventilation systems as well. 
um, and certainly sort of openable windows and things, uh, openable at, at kind of occupant height. So really understanding how what you're doing actually improves the space for the occupants themselves. Uh, so this building, uh, again, so this is a pharmacy and spa building uh, in Tokyo. And the whole design of the building really is it's kind of it's reinforcing a brand. Um, I would say it's got this really unique visual identity, identity which um, obviously with it being a, a pharmacy and a spa building has this focus on well-being, but also on sort of privacy and intimacy. And I think that's where kind of the, the lower light levels come from. Um, I think it was the Mexican architect, Louis Barragan, who kind of said that we'd sort of robbed our lives of any kind of privacy by introducing these huge swathes of plate glass, you know, everywhere in our buildings. Every space is flooded with daylight. And whilst daylight is, is you know, usually a positive thing, when there's no escape from it, when every space is a big public space, it kind of robs us of that kind of privacy, which is also really important for well-being. Um, and I think what I really liked about the drawings for these, which communicate that lighting strategy, is that the style of the, the drawings sort of intrinsically shows the underlying atmosphere and the concept of the building itself. So as soon as you move into a drawing that's communicating lighting, it doesn't immediately become this dry sort of drawing. It's actually communicating really well the overall atmosphere of the building that they're, they're kind of striving for. Uh, and then finally, in terms of kind of drawings uh, which are communicating a building level strategy. Um, so this is, is actually an example from one of our third year students. Um, an acoustic design is something which is often, well, it, it's, it's not addressed as often as some of the other features because I think people find it particularly hard uh, to communicate. And again, if I were going to sort of criticise this drawing, I kind of say it relies a little bit too much on explanatory text. Um, but I think it does success, successfully identify um, some of the, you know, the acoustic issues that need consideration. Things like external noise pollution, impact noise from things such as footsteps um, and reverberation times within the space. So, um, I mean, it, it's really tricky because I don't think you can see my cursor for me to try and point these things out to you, which makes it um, a little bit more awkward. But hopefully you can kind of see that at the top of the site there, you can kind of the external noise pollution um, from traffic has been identified. And then down in the actual building itself, which is nearer the river, um, obviously, with it being a bird sanctuary, they've identified the potential kind of noise coming from the birds themselves, as well as then the kind of the impact of footsteps and things of people moving around that, the space and how that might, given that this is a large glass building, which is going to be quite echoey, um, impact on other occupants, including the birds themselves. Um, so if we move from those kind of whole level building strategies into more detailed strategies, um, I wouldn't say I'm exactly Norman Foster's biggest fan. But what I think I do like about this series of drawings is that you go from a concept about how this space is going to be ventilated, where there's an opening in the facade and it passes through these kind of vertical gardens and then it spirals up these uh, floors of the the gherkin or St Mary's axe as they gradually sort of recede backwards. So there's kind of there's a conceptual level sketch there. And then we move into a more kind of traditional strategy level diagram for the whole building um, with the red, the, the red and blue arrows, the ubiquitous kind of red and blue arrows, which kind of identify that, yes, this is spiraling up the outside of the building in this particular way. I guess where my frustrations often come from um, I mean, not just from student submissions, but also when you're looking at other architects work as well, is when you then move into the detailed level of the drawing. And whilst, you know, there's there's nowhere for that fresh air to come in or there's nowhere for that hot air to get back out again. Um, so it's almost like there's red and blue arrows. All of a sudden they're expected to be sort of miasmically just passing through walls. 
Um, and, you know, somebody actually wrote a whole book about this saying, you know, air is stupid. It doesn't follow the arrows. You can't dictate that air is going to ventilate in that way just by drawing a red arrow uh, on your section. So actually thinking about when you get down into the detailed level of what is this building made of? How are you going to make that strategy that you've designed actually work? And this is where on the Foster's kind of double skin of the gherkin, um, we start to see these opening elements in the facades. This is actually a smart facade. Um, and as the temperature changes within the building, different panels um, on the skin open and close to facilitate the appropriate ventilation rate that's required to keep that space comfortable. So this is a, another example uh, from one of our uh, third years, a past third year. Um, and I do think actually a lot of the time some of the best drawings that we come across do come across do come from from some of our own kind of final year students, because in many ways, in terms of how you communicate your sustainability strategies, you might even be a little bit further ahead um, than some architects in practice who might resort to just farming this out to an m and engineer um, without integrating it into their design very well. And obviously, with a kind of growing sustainability agenda, that's going to become less and less viable. So it's important that this becomes an integral part of your design. And therefore, very often you guys are, are often at kind of the cutting edge of the best way of doing this and doing this in an artistic and creative way uh, rather than in a really kind of dull, dry, mechanical sort of way. Um, and in some ways, this was a particularly kind of ambitious and romantic sort of project. So it was an underground living crematorium, mushroom crematorium. So um, a really kind of out there project, but still backed up then with details to show how even this kind of almost cave like space could actually be serviced to meet modern standards. So it's really about us not reining in your creativity, but by making sure that that creativity isn't then undermined by you not being able to talk about how you would make this buildable and how you would make this habitable. Um, so in the section then on the right, you've got these really kind of romantic atmospheric sort of sketches on the left. And then in the right, you've got a slightly kind of drier section, which does nonetheless show how he's going to make these kind of really quite um, dramatic spaces work at a pragmatic level down from you know where the lighting comes in the natural lighting but also how he's going to supplement that with artificial lighting so hopefully you can kind of see that at the top of the space there with light coming in from the top um, to kind of achieve the sort of lighting effects and the dramatic shadows that he wants to achieve um, also, you can see that he's got that continuous line of insulation all the way around um, the space um, to make it thermally efficient. Um, and there is also this kind of a nod there, there's sort of a, a chimney like structure at the back there um, and some kind of reference to heat exchange, which I think probably requires a little bit more detail. But the principle is fundamentally sound. And it's not just about drawing these things through a, a technical section. You can also use perspectives um, to kind of convey that level of detail. So for example, in this case, this is a competition entry for the Oriental Concert Hall in Shanghai. And those details, such as the large acoustic rafts, which feature strongly in this image, really help to define that space. They're part of an acoustic strategy, but when you look at the perspective of this space, they're also clearly part of an acoustic, of a, an architectural strategy as well. And then moving on to my final set of drawings, just because I'm a, a becoming aware of time. Um, thinking about, so we're back to the bird sanctuary again. Um, and I think, um, as we discussed earlier, sustainable design or environment strategies can often be difficult to draw because they unfold over a period of time rather than being constant. So this is an example of this student showing how his daylighting strategy uh, on the left here works both in summer and in winter. Uh, and then obviously his artificial lighting strategy in terms of how this would work um, at night time. And again, this doesn't have to be captured through technical sections. You can do more kind of um, 
illustrative perspectives um, or sketches of how that space would change, um, how the whole kind of character of that space would change as artificial lighting is introduced um, at different times of the day. Um, so this again, this is a current third year student and there's, there's an awful lot going on in these drawings actually. So this is um, showing how solar gain, thermal mass and ventilation interact at different times of day and year to heat or cool their building. Um, and I'll be talking to you about solar gain, like I said, again, in a bit more detail tomorrow. But the main messages communicated by these diagrams are that the overhang of the roof minimizes how much direct sunlight and therefore heat make it in through the external kind of glazed envelope of this building um, in the summer. And that's shown in the top left there where you can see that actually, you know, the overhang is preventing a lot of that sunlight from coming in. But then in the diagram on the top right, you can see how the shallow angle of the sun in the winter um, means that actually quite a lot of solar gain does manage to penetrate that space in the winter and you get the benefit of those heat gains. So the central column in this space is made out of rammed earth, which has a very high thermal mass. I don't know if Zaid has mentioned thermal mass yet, but again, it's something I'll be discussing tomorrow. And thermal mass is really when a material, usually a very high density material, like stone or concrete or rammed earth, has a really high thermal capacity. For anybody who did physics, that term thermal capacity will probably be quite high. Or in, uh, sorry, th that term thermal capacity will probably be quite familiar. Um, or in layman's terms, it basically means that that material can soak up a lot of heat and hold it. And this can have a cooling effect on the space, as we see in the top left diagram for the summer, um, because the, as the heat is soaked up by the rammed earth, it's not allowing the air in the space to get hotter. So overall, it immediately has this cooling effect. Then at night, when the temperature begins to drop, that heat that's been soaked up by the thermal mass is then re-radiated back out into the space. Now in summer, obviously this is not considered to be a good thing, you know, this heat is, is unwanted and therefore you would use purge vent ventilation. So purge ventilation is a very high rate of ventilation. So imagine you've just burned the toast and you're opening all the windows in your house to try and get rid of that smell. That is effectively purge ventilation. So in summer, when that heat starts re-radiating out into the space at night, you open all the windows and you purge all of that heat from the building so that when you come back in in the morning, you're back down to a nice cool temperature and your thermal mass is ready to soak up all this heat again. In the winter, that re-radiated heat is precious and you shut the building down and you hang on to it and that helps to bring the space back up to a comfortable temperature by the morning. So I appreciate that's quite a lot of information there. And I don't know how much of that you've already covered with Zaid. So you may not have gotten all of the information about the strategies there. And we'll review a lot of that tomorrow. But hopefully, if nothing else, what you can appreciate is that this building is functioning in very different ways environmentally, depending on the time of day and the time of year. And that these four um, very simple diagrams are actually communicating a lot of complex information very well. Um, and back to my bird sanctuary as well. You can tell I like this project. Um, so I think this is a good example of how other environmental factors also vary between seasons. It's not just temperature, but also as the site analysis and uh, axonometric show. Also daylighting and noise pollution are going to vary as kind of like the amount of vegetation around the site changes as well. Um, and you can show these things also through more po poetic perspectives rather than just these kind of technical drawings. So, for example, this one shows how biodiversity will change over the course of the seasons, as well as the effect that kind of those changes in vegetation are going to have on lighting um, and the angle of the sun. So, for example, the elongated shadows uh, in the bottom winter image. And then my last example. Um, so finally, sustainability and environmental studies may play out over many, many years. Um, so this is an example of Eco Boulevard in Madrid. 
Um, so in Madrid, public spaces don't get used if they don't provide sufficient shade from the sun. Uh, and what these tree towers um, that you can see in the kind of the photographs on the left do is they provide temporary shade for people to use that space, but also creating the ideal, the ideal conditions within which for trees to grow. Um, and they can be covered over in the winter to kind of keep them warm enough and, and that sort of thing. And what this does is part of a 20-year project allowing the rest of the boulevard to be planted over time. So the idea is that eventually the trees grown in these two tree towers, these two greenhouse type space, spaces, the trees grown in there would eventually be planted out um, over the boulevard until the boulevard is thriving and it's the original towers themselves that can be removed. So again, we may be talking, you know, over periods of decades that some of these kind of strategies are unfolding. And that's why communicating this stuff can sometimes be, be quite tricky. So I've been talking a lot about what I think about these drawings. Um, so I think it's time to hear a little bit more about what you guys think. Um, hopefully you'll have had chance to download the slides already. Uh, if you haven't, I'm going to drop a link um, to what you need to have access to in the chat now. So if you haven't already downloaded the slides, I, select you, I suggest you click on the link in the chat and that will provide you um, with the following information. So uh, I'm going to break you up into breakout rooms uh, in groups of sort of four or five. Um, and you should be able to see in your breakout room what number group you're in. And um, what I've done is in the set of slides that you're about to download, you'll see that there are four images. So we've got that should say image one. I don't know why that doesn't have image one on the top of it. OK, I don't know where that's gone. I apologize. They used to say image one, image two, image three, image four on the top of them. And that seems to have disappeared. Um, but I mean, they're basically in in order. So the first image is image one. The second one is image two, so on and so forth. You. Uh... OK, fantastic. Good. Thank you, Timmy. So the image one, image two is actually on the link. Um, so if you know, it might help if you do download the link, even if you've already downloaded the slides, just to have that. Thank you, Timmy. Um, so you should know, you should be able to see which group you're in. Uh, each group has been allocated to a particular image. So the image is at the top of the column. And what I'd like you to do is if you uh, go away in your groups and think about the following questions. Uh, for each image, um, for the image that you've been allocated, sorry, not for each image, for the image that you've been allocated. So thinking about what environmental and sustainable design considerations are being communicated. So hopefully that will be fairly straightforward. What is it that they're actually communicating? Um, you know, how well are they communicating what's actually happening? So when I say what are they communicating, you know, they're communicating acoustics, they're communicating ventilation, and then is it clear? Are you able to explain in your own words what it is they're saying about those strategies? And then the other questions are slightly more evaluative. So what do you think is working well about the image? What do you think is not working so well? And if you're going to take that image and improve it, what would you do with it? So in your groups, just go away and kind of think about those five questions with respect to the image that you have been allocated. Um, and then we'll kind of meet back, um, just thinking, probably in about 10 minutes. Yes, yeah, so we'll make it 10 minutes and we'll just have a very brief kind of feedback session. Is everybody clear? Does anybody have any any questions? OK, well, oh, OK, maybe there are questions. Um, so you should. So it should tell you, I'm going to assign you to groups now, and it should tell you when I assign you to the breakout room, it should tell you which group you're going into. If you miss it when you get assigned to the group, I just go to the participants bit on the chat. Um, so on the bar on the right hand side, if you click on the two people with the attendees, and it should tell you who's in your group and which group you're in. OK, 
Um, I will dip in and out of the groups if you like, just to make sure there's no problems. OK, so I'm going to start the groups now and you don't need to worry about coming back into this room. I will stop uh, the group session and it will be brought back into here automatically. OK, so I shall see you in 10 minutes. So those of you who are looking at image one, um, do you want to either by putting your hand up and telling us what you think or writing in the chat um, or if you want to draw on the slide can? Do you want to tell me what it is um, about what what it is that you think that that image was communicating? Yes, by all means. Is it Saiwan? Uh, feel free to switch your switch your microphone on. Yeah, we as a group like came to the conclusion that it's showing a lot of information and that isn't directed to the specific places that it should be. Uh, for example, uh, there, there's some diagrams um, above the image that showcase uh, things and explanations uh, for the site itself, but it's in the wrong order, I believe. And uh, we came to the conclusion that it, it was. And uh, they've showed a lot of um, in, in text without any color uh, in terms of like the water evaporating on the lake and also for the sunlight. and. Um, the other things as well. Uh, yeah. But one thing that could be improved would be the layout and perhaps make the picture bigger. Yeah, there's just, I mean, I think uh, as, as an overall, I think this, this sketch does a really good job of communicating a lot of information, or it does a good job of communicating a lot of information. But I think one thing that people have commented on in the chat and that you've addressed as well is that there's just too much going on in the one drawing isn't it and and not necessarily in any particular order um i mean in some ways i think the fact that it's not happening in any particular order is um maybe intentional because it's this is quite an early concept sketch so maybe it's just showing that this is one messy interconnected thing um, but yeah, when you've got that amount of information on the drawing, you do start to think about, well, actually, how could you make some of that information clearer using colour or by giving it a particular order? So, yeah, thank you very much. Some really good points picked up there um, in the chat as well as um, as well as by. Am I saying that correctly? Sorry, is it so one? Yeah, that is correct. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I'm just aware of time, uh, so we'll move on to the second uh, image. Anybody who's anybody in one of the groups who was looking at the second image have any comments about what it is you think that's being communicated here? What works and what doesn't work? What would you improve? Yes, Alexia, feel free to put your microphone on. So I think uh, it was time to uh, talk about the lighting and the acoustic and the vegetations. A vegetation yeah. and i think it uh, magic uh, it managed to do that with the little icons like the birds and the sun and the vegetation but i also think it's a bit confusing for the other arrows that uh, don't really have a label or an icon to yes. communicate yeah I'm does anybody else have anything they'd like oh sorry sorry no does anybody else have anything else they'd like to add to that? I think those are all really valid points. Uh, so we've got a comment here. I think the drawing is nice. It's clear. It's not over sketched, but it would be nice if the author added some color uh, for most important parts like impacts of sun, view, sky or, or nature. So I think um, you've both picked up on on sort of two two of the most important criticisms I have of this particular drawing. So I think it does some really good things uh, in terms of you get a great sense of occupation uh, from this drawing and of kind of some of the strategies that are going on there in terms of the, the kind of biodiversity and things like that. But yes, I agree, views, lighting, uh, thermal efficiency, they're all treated with exactly the same kind of arrow and it's very difficult to know what exactly is being addressed. And then the other thing I'd pick up on is is probably uh, what I think Martina's alluding to in the chat is is kind of context. Um, it's very strange to have this kind of building just sort of floating 
in white space without any real understanding of what is that view you know that little guy sat in the window boxes on the 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 bottom uh left you know he's got a view out what's he got a view of you know is it you know the m4 you know so you don't really get any context of, of what's really happening there so again another good set of, of, of very valid points um and like i said we could probably talk about this a little bit longer but um i'm just aware of of time um who was looking at image number three any comments suggestions criticisms yes hamish yeah, so um, in terms of sort of the considerations around how the water is recycled and different ventilation elements, it's really, really clear. Um, in fact, on, on most kind of points of being able to visualize size and scope of those different features, it, it does do quite a good job. Um, one thing that it doesn't do too well is sort of communicate things like how light's going to penetrate the space. There's a couple of annotated details about that. Um, but it isn't really conveyed visually, which makes it really hard with something like an air aircraft hangar where you really assume that um, lighting has to be something that's really, really controlled in order for them to do maintenance. That's something that's not communicated particularly well here. Yeah, so the, the scope of this drawing is, is much narrower, isn't it? It's almost yeah. entirely focused on things like ventilation and water management. And then there's all sorts of other things to do with kind of thermal efficiency. You know, there's very little context. You know, it's sitting on the ground and it is underneath the sky. But other than that, we don't really know anything else about it. And there's no reference to lighting either, as you say. Uh, anybody else got any comments on that one? Okay, so we'll move on to the problematic fourth image. <laughs> oh, sorry, I had one about that image. Yeah, go for it. Um, I was going to say, like, the sun path wasn't really communicated at all. They kind of just had an image of the sun. It's kind of the same with the rain. It doesn't really show how yeah. it interacts. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I get fairly exasperated if I get images from students that say things like the sun is that sorry, the sun, uh, the sun is in the sky or rain comes from above. It's like you don't need a diagram to explain that unless unless that unless you're actually telling a, a broader story than that, then there's not really uh, much point in including those things on the diagram. So, yeah, completely agree. Fairly arbitrary sort of bits of iconography there with no real sort of uh, intent behind why they're there yeah again another val very valid point thank you very much okay so i can see that timmy in particular is really champing at the bit to get her teeth into this um do you want to switch your microphone on <laughs> yeah so um it's a really confusing um in our group we're talking about there might be a window but we don't really know because there's literally no environment around it it's just an inner space and yeah whereas like we guess that these at the top might be the triangles might be some kind of lamps but we weren't that sure of that either so we we yeah. understood that there's some sort of floor heating uh from the tiles but that was basically it and we get that there's a statue so probably it's a gallery or a museum or something but <laughs> yeah unfortunately i think in um in in blackboard it's not as easy as it would be in teams for me to just pull up a picture of the actual kimball art gallery which might give you a bit more more context if you like to kind of understand the image but i would encourage you to look it up so it's the renzo piano kimball art gallery um just put it in um, so I'd encourage you to look at the gallery spaces and it might make this look make might make this look uh, might make this make a little bit more sense. Um, but yeah, it is. It's a very kind of messy, confusing sketch. Um, I suppose what I like about it and what I've why I've included in it, why I've included it. Oh, words are hard. Um, why I have included it. Um, is because it's um, it's a really early concept 
type sketch that brings a lot of stuff together, a lot of really detailed environmental thinking, um, you know, uh, together for one particular space in quite a lot of detail and starts talking about how these things are working together. So you're right, there is some kind of underfloor heating coming from the plenum uh, underneath the floor. It's uh, it's not a, a window, it is in fact sort of like a, a painting or something hanging on the wall. But yeah, that's not that evident unless you understand uh, what what it is, what the, the building is. And then above what you have, so you have the, it's a glass ceiling and those are acoustic baffles. Well, they, they serve an acoustic purpose in that they they kind of uh, they act as acoustic baffles, reducing the reverberation time in that space. But then they also bounce. What you're starting to see, hopefully, is you can see that if you if you kind of understand that that ceiling is glass, those zigzag, almost kind of lightning shape lines show how light comes in directly from overhead. So in Texas, obviously the sun is quite strong, so it comes down from overhead, it bounces off the top of one baffle onto the other side of another and down onto the space. So it's a mechanism for kind of diffusing light directly from above and bringing diffuse light into a space, because obviously direct sunlight uh, onto artwork is not a good idea because it will fade it and it will start to deteriorate and the UV radiation will start to break it down any kind of organic materials and then you can kind of see how on the edge of each of those fins there's actually some artificial spotlighting mounted as well um but yeah that's quite a good sort of i think i probably took it for granted there that people were sort of vaguely aware of what that building was to begin with so i think the next time i do this exercise i'll probably include a little photograph or something just so you've got a better sense of what it is that you're looking at um but the fact that you can't tell without the photograph probably says quite a lot about the image in the first place and that it's maybe not working quite as well. It's almost more of a, a way of thinking for the a process of thinking for the architect themselves rather than being very good at communicating um, some of the things that are going on there. Does anyone else have any other comments about this sort of slightly problematic um, fourth image? OK, well, if nobody else has any comments, um, I'm aware of time, so I'll just quickly wrap up. Um, so I'm really hoping um, that over the course of the last hour, you have started to develop this kind of awareness of various means of communicating environmental and sustainable methods, uh, sustainable design, sorry, using visual methods. Um, and I guess the main point that I would like to take away from you guys, that I would like you guys to take away from this is really that there are any number of ways of doing this and it's really just about finding, um, so it kind of relates back to the question that just popped up in the chat about which ones would you use. It really depends on the project, it's about choosing the most appropriate sort of drawing for where you're at in the design process. Obviously you're not going to do a completely you know, polished CAD overlay of a building that you haven't designed yet. So is it going to be one of those messy hand sketches that's sort of an idea about how all these things might hang together? If you're at an early stage in the design process, that's going to be more appropriate. It depends what it is you're designing. If you're designing an art gallery, then obviously lighting is going to be really important. If you're designing a theatre, then you're probably not going to want a lot of daylight in there and you're probably going to be thinking more about acoustics and artificial lighting and ventilation and things like that. So what you include also depends on what it is you're designing. Um, and it also depends on, on you. What are your priorities and what how do you communicate best as an architect, as a designer? You know, Choose the methods that fit in best with, with your way of communicating your ideas. So hopefully what I've managed to show you is that there's a whole range of methods you can use and it's really about exploring those methods and finding the ones that are most appropriate for you at that point in time. And then in terms of um, sort of objectives two and three, so analysis of two dimensional graphics um, and, criti and critically appraising um, some of those graphics. Um, the intent there was really for you to, uh, again, start to look at and appraise examples of how this has been done previously 
um, so that you can start to choose the ones um, that you think um, are, are most appropriate and are something that you would like to use in your design studio project. So I hope that all sort of makes sense. If anybody's got any questions, uh, feel free to stick around and ask them. Otherwise, uh, we'll leave it there and I shall see you all again tomorrow uh, for technology where we'll be talking about an introduction to passive heating strategies. Okay, have a good day and I'll see you again tomorrow.